go. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This week, I'm very lucky to have Dame Sarah Thornton, DBE, QPM. Um, we met back in 2015 when she just finished being the Chief Constable of Thames Valley Police, which she'd done since 2007, which is a long time to be a Chief Constable. And she'd taken on as the first chair of the National Police Chiefs Council, a, a key one, bringing all the best brains together the, at this top level of the table. She's had a fascinating career thus far, continues to do amazing work. She is an honorary Air Commodore in the Royal Air Force, and she was the UK Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner. And that was a fascinating role. And she's kept those kind of things going on right now in the multiple roles that she's doing. Without further ado, I'll uh, hand her over and tell me a bit about yourself and your career thus far, Sarah. Well, hello, Jonathan, and it's lovely to be working with you again. As you said, for, for 33 years, I, I was a police officer and, and 12 of those uh, a chief constable. Uh, Thames Valley for eight years and to have that opportunity to to lead and shape a force for that extended time was it was a real privilege it was tough and challenging at times but but very very rewarding and then as you said I, I went on to chair the National Police Chiefs Council bringing all the chiefs in the United Kingdom together and you might imagine that could be quite challenging because often they have quite strong views and they don't always agree but then for the last four years, um, I've been going in a slightly different direction. I've been working in the anti-slavery movement, first uh, as the United Kingdom's independent anti-slavery commissioner, and then more recently, um, continuing with that theme as a professor of practice in modern slavery policy, uh, at the Rights Lab, which is a research center in the University of Nottingham, and then also as a consultant in modern slavery for an investment management company. Um, very different challenges. I mean, police leadership was, was very challenging. You know, I, I learned to be resilient, um, you know, getting good people around you, building strong teams is really important. And I guess I was you know, endlessly curious and concerned and, and probably pretty driven. Um, you know, it's really important when you're doing something like policing and you're in an organisation where, you know, there's all these ranks and uniforms with uh, smart badges and, and that could easily turn your head. And of course, the trick is not to let it. Uh, so, you know, never taking anything for granted, trying to avoid hubris and complacency were kind of really, really important because, you know, when you're senior, people can tend to tell you uh, what they think you want to hear. Mm -hmm. um, in more recent years, um, no longer have responsibility for thousands of people, um, very much about uh, learning new things, maybe much more about thought leadership, uh, about understanding how movements work, and, and to a certain extent, applying some of my old lessons for, from a public life in policing to, to new problems. Mm. Well, it, it's fascinating. And we're going to in a moment talk about what inspiring leadership means to you, because this is the theme of the of this of the series. Well, over 260 podcasts thus far and some some fascinating, eclectic mix of different people. Before I talk about that, you know, I, I'm just fascinated um, by the whole area of anti-slavery. Um, as you and I know, and you very kindly connected with uh, Lee, and we'll be chatting more. You know, she she has a charity which is helping deal with the issue of violence against women and girls, which is such a big issue both in the police and in government and in society. But but as we talk about people who've suffered from abuse, uh, modern day slavery, and trafficking, and mental health issues, a lot of people go, well, you know. Why are we worrying about slavery? You know, something that happened, you know, ages ago, the colonies and things like that, and people transported from Africa. But if I'm right, and, you know, it, it, it isn't over by any means. In fact, if what I remember reading, and you're the expert, so please correct me on this, but I was reading an article yesterday, which was saying slavery's more serious than it's ever been. There's 40 million people in slavery around the world, according to what this article was saying. But I, I just wondered if you could, just share just in a couple of minutes the the toxicity of anti uh, of uh, dealing with this this whole issue of slavery and trafficking and how how serious is the problem, sir? So you know the article that you read yesterday quoted uh, the old figures for the estimates of slavery across the globe. The most recent figures, which were published in September last year, uh, estimate fifty million people. Wow! So over the five year period, it, it is in increased. 
uh, about 28 million of those are believed to be in forced labour across the globe. So that might be in farms, in mines, in fisheries, um, so much of uh, the global supply chains on which we rely for, for food and for clothes and for electronics are, are tainted uh, by slavery and trafficking. And, and it's not just in the uh, rest of the world, it's not just in the global south, this is something which is happening uh, in our country today. So whether it's about the sexual exploitation of women who are trafficked here, or maybe vulnerable women who are enslaved into the sex industry, or whether it's migrant workers on farms or factories, or people maybe in catering and cleaning, you know, people are being forced to give their labor uh, in a way that is just not free. And in a way which uh, you and I, you know, if we knew Sometimes I think just how close we were to the exploitation of other people, we will be utterly horrified. But it's a hidden crime. Uh, and that's one of the problems, of course. It's quite hard to uh, count. Um, and that's why the estimates are important. But it's also, you know, hard to investigate. Uh, and one of my key kind of uh, aims when I was uh, anti-slavery commissioner was to make sure that we were bringing more of the offenders to justice, more of the criminals. Uh, and that requires a lot of resource and expertise by police uh, forces to mount those investigations and then work with the prosecutors to bring people to justice. But, you know, if we don't do that, people see as the uh, rewards as high and the risks as low. And of course, the, 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 the aim is to, to change that round. So the rewards are low and the risks are as high as we possibly can make them. Yeah, well, well it was very interesting. Uh, Lee had an event at, uh, down in London at the Goldsmiths Hall, which you, unfortunately you couldn't attend, but it would you would have been brilliant at it because we had uh, someone speaking on behalf of the Serious Organised Crime uh, from the Home Office and somebody else, one of the senior police officers, speaking about just how serious this issue is of violence against women and girls and also trafficking. And um, people think, oh, well, you know, it doesn't happen near me. Well, you know, you only need to go to perhaps some of the car washes and you, uh, particularly with the Serious Organised Crime, and you go, do all those people there want to be working there? Have they chosen to work there? And then is it also... Uh, an undercurrent of serious organised crime and drugs and the um, the sort of uh, the spread, the, the tentacles that go out on county lines of drugs and crime and, and people who are forced to help criminals. Uh, anything more you want to sort of say on that? Well, hand car washes are a really good example of where there is a high risk of exploitation. And we, we know that from law enforcement, we know that from lots of uh, research and surveys over the years. Um, it's one of those businesses where the business model probably relies on people not being paid properly as a very kind of basic issue. But actually, as you rightly say, frequently a lot of exploitation linked to other criminality, sometimes used to, to launder money, to launder proceeds of, of crime. Uh, so a, a real concern. And I think all of us just need to be very careful. It might look like it's a, a good deal to have your car hand washed rather than go to through a machine but in fact you might well be uh, complicit in the exploitation of others there's some really good um, apps you can download onto your phone um, which are about safe car washing and if you fill in the questions on the app they will say either sounds okay or actually your answers mean this is a bit of a, a an issue can you please call the modern slavery helpline and let them know where it is and what the problems are and that can then be passed on to law enforcement and, and I, I'm going to get that app. What what is it called? Where do I do? You remember what it's called? Yeah, I think it's the Safer Car Wash app. Safer Safer Car Wash app. Okay, no, great. I'm I'm going to do that because um, I do myself use a car wash uh, with people, and I think they're Kosovo. I'm not sure where they're from, but the, um, there's a there's a whole no. They're Kurds actually. They're all Kurds, um, but it'd be interesting to know what goes on. Um, and, and yes, we're seeing, particularly with the exploitation of some of the girls who are beneficiaries of the Inspiring Leadership Foundation that Lee runs, um, the Albanian and the Serb gangs in London are particularly rife uh, with their criminality and you don't want to mess with them. OK, um, amongst all that, we need more than ever good, inspiring leaders, both as politicians making some making the right decisions and often they dodge uh, those issues um but uh leaders like yourself and others and you've experienced throughout your 33 years in the police and and 
other things that you've done, good leaders and uninspiring leaders. But for you, what does inspiring leadership mean to you? I think, you know, it's primarily about a sense of a relationship, you know, particularly in policing, because it's so hierarchical. You could rely on the rank, you know, you could tap your shoulder, you know, do as I say, because I've got the rank. But what we really need is for people to want to follow you. They need to trust you as the leader. I, I always really like the ideas around trustworthy leadership. Um, people can rely on you to be consistent, um, to, to have integrity, to um, practice high ethical standards, and also to have their best interests at heart. Um, and I think that is really, really important. It's something that I try to practice but if I think about when I best responded to other leaders, it's when I've sensed there's that relationship, that there's that sense of I can trust them, they value me, uh, I, I'm included. I, I guess what I do now is much more about thought leadership. Um, and so you know, having a vision and some courage in pursuing that vision is really important. But, but I think it's also about creating those networks of trust about uh, people, about how do you convene like-minded people to build support so so again it, even though it's thought leadership i think there's a sense of that uh relational side of leadership which is really really important yeah and and i i think also i i, I find the most credible inspiring leaders are the ones who sort of combined that bit of thought leadership academia reading and researching it i'm, I'm looking forward to getting admiral william mcraven uh who did when he'd had a, a tough time uh, and was uh, taken out of one particular job, which because he, he had a clash with the, the, the boss there, um, it looked like his career had a bit of a bruising. But actually, he went and did, I think, a master's degree um, and he studied special forces operations and wrote the definitive guide on it. And then he went back into leadership all over again. And he was the one whose team captured Osama and killed, captured and killed Osama bin Laden, but a very brave man in his own right. But I think the ones I have the most time for have actually practiced like you have as a, as, as a police chief from 2007, 2015, it's a long time, 12 years. And then other jobs that you've done. And now that you're put, trying to put some frameworks onto what you've learned and what does work. I mean, clearly there's, thousands and thousands of books written on leadership but i think people listening to this one sarah particularly want to take away practical tips and advice which is what we're going to be talking about and also personal stories from you who've been on the front line been dealing with people who are on the front line and have to make the least worst decision as churchill would describe it you know when you're in situations where nothing seems clear about what is the right decision but your job is to make decisions as a leader I don't know what your thoughts are I think that's right I mean I love the phrase least worst decision and it's a phrase that I frequently used um you know particularly the more senior you get you know the top of the decisions because they're the ones that have been escalated through the organization because other people didn't feel comfortable making them but they're always shades of gray they're never black and white it's never clear which is the right decision and which is the wrong decision you're, you're working in that uh, area, which is it's about the least worst decision. But I think you make a really interesting point about um, the combination of the academy and practice um, and how sometimes the very best leaders can com combine those. One of the things that I do at, at the Rights Lab now is try and think about how our research uh, can be translated into the worlds of both policy and practice. Because, you know, the risk for the academy, for the university is that it's all very intellectually interesting, but actually where is its impact? Where is it making a difference in terms of improving um, the lives of vulnerable people or improving policy responses or the response of business? So I think that's really key. And I've done a little bit of work over the years and actually did some work as the commissioner um, on this point about translation how do you bridge from the academy into the world of policy and practice really really important and if you yourself can be the embodiment of that how much better is that how much more powerful is that yeah i so so agree with you and 
uh, I went to a program at Harvard, which was fascinating. Uh, one or two of them were really very inspiring. Donna Hicks sticks in my mind, um, who, who wrote a fabulous book on dignity, which actually would tie in very nicely with what you're doing. Professor Donna Hicks from Harvard, her book is called Dignity. And she talks about the, the 10 components of what give people dignity and the 10 destroyers of dignity. And um, it, it is really interesting, this concept that everybody is born with the right to dignity, to, to be tr treated with dignity. Not uh, Respect can be earned and that kind of thing can be lost. But dignity is a, is a born right to everybody, every human in the world, which is quite an interesting one. And then there was... Uh, one or two there that I went, yeah, you got some experience, but I'm not so sure. Too academic, not enough practical experience, and particularly biased with the particular opinions that you hold. So, at times, I've I, I find from experience, it's that that combination of them, and then obviously, people like uh, General the Lord Dallet, who studied a lot but had huge practical experience as a as a soldier, not only on the streets of Northern Ireland where he got his his uh, MC, but but also in other work that he did. Um, what a, what a life you've had thus far, and and lots more to do. If you look back on it, Sarah, what would be a happiest, proudest moment, uh, and what did you learn from that? And then also, would you perhaps share with us a dark moment that was really challenging, and what you learned from that as well? Because we've always we either succeed or we learn something, and if we succeed, we also learn something. So it'd be interesting to hear about that. I think certainly the proudest moment and probably career-wise the happiest moment is when I was made a dame of the Order of the British Empire. I mean, mm. what what a, a, a thrill and a, a privilege. And of course it reflects the work of the organisations that I worked. It wasn't just about me. But for me personally, um, it, it was a, a huge thrill. And my one regret is that my parents weren't alive to see it. I think my father in particular would have been amazed that his daughter had become a Dane. I mean, not that he didn't have high expectations, but actually it was not something that he would ever, ever have anticipated. So, um, uh, you know, a very sweet moment just tinged with that sense of sadness um, that they weren't around to see it. But, uh, you know, what, what a thrill. In terms of darkest moments and and I was thinking as uh I was preparing for this podcast this is now 10 years ago but I can still uh feel very keenly the emotions that were uh coursing through me at the time and it was when we were dealing with organized child abuse in in Oxford and we had had suspicions and concerns that there was a degree of child abuse in terms of girls who maybe were in care, some of them um, were vulnerable in other ways, uh, were being groomed by a, a gang who were operating in, in East Oxford. And we got together with the social workers and the county council and said, look, we think there's something going on here. They said, so do we. And we actually set up a joint task force to tackle the issue. Um, which led to uh, the prosecution of, of the ringleaders of the gang at the Old Bailey. And I have been very involved in that, partly because it was a substantial issue, um, partly because I guess I was aware that some of the allegations were five, six years old. So there was always a sense in which, well, it's all very well having a successful prosecution now, but why didn't you do it earlier? Why did you miss what was happening? And as the case was going through uh, at the Old Bailey, the trial was going on. Um, my colleagues who were down at the trial, the uh, investigating officers, were saying, I think we're going to be really heavily criticised um, at the end of this um, because we haven't acted sooner and what has gone on has been utterly appalling, you know, egregious sexual offending. Uh, and they were right. Uh, the criticism of, of the force was excoriating at the end of that trial, notwithstanding the fact that uh, the men had been convicted. And I 
had decided with colleagues that uh, if questions began to be asked about the force, then really there was only one person who could answer those questions, and that was me. And I would be the person who fronted the media and was was held to account. Uh, and I can remember the, I think it was the day after the uh, convictions were um, announced, I did a sort of a whole uh, schedule of media interviews, radio, television, newspapers. Uh, the worst one was the Today programme. And I was on that 10 past eight slot and you're doing it live. And I was doing it live from a van in the car park at headquarters. Uh, and I could, I could see, I can still remember it so clearly. Um, and it was it was really tough because I, I, I personally apologised to the uh, young women involved who'd given evidence who were so brave. I'd met their families. Um, I was determined that we were going to learn everything we could from from why it had taken so long. Um, but really, he had me on the ropes in terms of defending what had happened. Mm. Uh, and I, as I say, I can still still remember. And of course, his final question was, "Are you going to resign?" Um, and I, you know, I, I guess in a way, the fact that it was so dark and I felt it so viscerally myself really made me determined that our response was going to be uh, effective, comprehensive, far reaching, would be resourced. And, and, and it was all that. Um, but, it, you know, I can still remember how tough it was. And, it, you know, it really caused me, you know, what could I have done differently? You know, is this somehow my responsibility? And, and there's a part of me which is, but hold on a minute. It, it wasn't the police force. It wasn't Thames Valley Police, it, the offenders. It was this criminal gang. But you can't say that. Uh, when you're on the radio, you've got to be thinking about um, how to, to to be held to account appropriately and, and to give people some confidence that you can sort it out. The The postscript to that story is that several years later, I was in the uh, Today studio at Radio 4, and it was towards the end of John Humphrey's career there. It was one of his last appearances. And we were having a chat in the green room beforehand about various other issues. I'd moved on jobs. And I said to him, I said, you know, I can still remember that interview and it was one of the most awful experiences. Not, not that it was inappropriate, but it was just so tough. And he said to me, oh, I'm so sorry I made you feel like that. And in a way that kind of was, it was a helpful sort of close off for me in terms of what had happened, because actually it was about doing the right thing. If I had my time again, yes, it was very uncomfortable, but of course I would do it. I could have sent somebody else to do it. Of course I could, many others would have done, but I felt it was, um, on my watch and I was accountable. You're so right. And it's very easy for people like John Humphreys, <clears throat> and in my case myself, to say to people, why didn't you resign? Um, now, there, there are many cases when things have gone so badly wrong, and you can look at some recent politicians where the only right thing to do was to resign, but they wouldn't. Uh, indeed, they rather love being in the middle of it. And you could look at politicians in the UK and in America for that. But I remember um, alienating myself, probably affecting my whole career, when the director of infantry was having a whole group of infantry officers together and he was railing against the government for um, cutting back the size of the army. I mean, this is many, we were 160,000, we're now I think 78,000. And there's been many micro cuts, but of course now we're facing a future of World War Three, and we've got the army smaller than the number of councillors we have in local councils. Um, something is a bit amiss. Um, but uh, he was saying, I was really annoyed about this and it's so wrong and, you know, they shouldn't have got rid of all these different regiments. And I, rather sort of young and naive at the back of the of the auditorium, stuck up my hand and said, General, if you felt so strongly, why didn't you resign? And, and there was this deathly hush. And he said, what's your name? And I had to give my name. And, and I, I'm quite sure why I ever made it beyond major. <laughs> and, uh, you can sometimes look back and see certain marks in your life. But that was a rather naive thing for me to say. But it was a it's 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 fine for people to be an armchair critic. It's much harder when you're the one there and whether you can stay and do something about it uh, and what, you know, learning from it. I think it was we call it the after action reviews. Um, Thinking back to your your career and the experience you've learned now and all the research you've done and, and the the bruises and the scars you carry, but the learning you have with it. If you went back to meet Sarah Thornton, aged 16 to 18, or other people who've got young daughters, 
at that age, what bit of advice would you give to yourself that might be very relevant for others who are listening? I think if I go back to those sort of early years, you know, um, late teens, early 20s, I would want to say to myself, it's okay to try and fail. I, I think I was brought up with a very strong be perfect driver. Um, and I think it probably may be quite cautious. Mm. Um, the, the classic, I guess, is, you know, if I wanted to uh, apply for anything, if I was interested in any opportunity, you know, I would want to tick all the boxes. Um, and that sense in which uh, I probably uh, felt very uncomfortable with the notion of, of, of trying and failing. So I, I do think that probably... Uh, would be the most important thing you know it, it doesn't matter um, if you try and fail um, it matters more if you don't try in the first place so I, I, I do think I was more cautious than, than, than I than I should have been. It's such an interesting one I've been listening to David Goggins who is this uh, elite uh, performer did Navy SEAL training he was by his own mission hugely obese before he went into naval selection I did it three times three hell weeks, as they call them, uh, a phenomenal um, situation. But he himself had been through, we're talking about abuse, abuse with the father who beat him, beat his mother, and he'd often watch his father abusing his mother. And and, and so therefore, after that, his book was called Can't Hurt Me, because, you know, whatever abuse they threw at him in Navy SEAL training was nothing compared to what he'd gone through. So he weaponized his horrendous experiences to see things as it's okay to try and fail. That, that, that abbreviation that's often used, F-A-I-L, stands for first attempt in learning. So I didn't fail, it was just my first attempt. And then my second attempt, and on my third attempt, I got in. And I think it is interesting, these drivers that we have, you know, you talked about drivers and those who, who haven't come across this psychological term, there's, I think about four or five, which is be perfect, be strong, uh, work hard, please others, hurry up. I think those are five. The drivers that we all have, and I have all five of them, so loads of baggage that we all carry. But it, it is interesting when you're at this stage to make it okay for young uh, adolescents to give their best attempt, their first attempt, not to try. Trying is lying, as Luke was told by Yoda, Luke, there is no try. There is either do or don't do. So, but but being okay, what do you learn from it? Um, so I, I love what your, your tip is there. Um, what would you do differently if you look back on your life again? Is there anything you'd do differently? Well, the obvious thing is to say, taking a few more risks. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I can think of a couple of, of career opportunities which I let pass me by, and I think in hindsight I could and should have been bolder. Mm. Um, I think I got bolder as I went on, but I, I I definitely missed opportunities. But then I'm also inclined to give myself a bit of a uh, uh, not a, not a let off, but you know I think back to when I joined policing in the 1980s. Yeah, the culture was pretty tough, and sometimes it was just about surviving. Um, and uh, I always used to say, I can remember that, you know, don't be a tall poppy because tall poppies have a really hard time. And and I, I, I remember going on some leadership courses as a sergeant and I found the notebooks uh, a few years ago. And there was that sense in, you know, what I felt I needed to do to fit in. Um, and uh, what's interesting, I think now when I look back on it now, sort of, you know, my goodness, nearly 40 years ago, um, as a senior officer, I genuinely believe that the culture had changed and changed for the better. But I do wonder when I, you know, read about and hear about some of the more recent scandals in policing, it makes me wonder whether, in fact, I was wishfully thinking things had improved and that maybe there are still real issues about the way in which the culture is pretty tough. But I'm not going to let myself completely off the hook. I do think I, I could have... Uh, taken taken more risks I, I think you know the the um point about the perfect driver 
I think it's also a gendered issue. And, 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 and I think being a woman in an organization which was mainly male, I remember talking to uh, a friend in policing, another woman officer who was also very senior. And that way in which we brought up, you know, don't show off. That's what our mothers would say, don't show off. Who do you think you are, the Queen of Sheba? Mm. And that sense in which, you know, being compliant, fitting in was really quite, quite important. And, and as I say, and, and being perfect. Yeah, you, you raised so many things that resonate for me there, Sarah. Thank you for that. I mean, um, don't show off. Uh, don't be too big for your boots. Um, don't get a swollen head. Um, uh, that came from my mother, uh, who brought me up. Uh, so father was killed when I was two and a half. You might remember when we were coaching together. Um, and that was her view of the world. Um, and, and I think she was a very talented woman. Did a lot for... Uh, charity she's a big philanthropist even though she had hardly any money she did lots of good for Halifax where we we grew up and she chaired various committees but but often um it, it is a gender uh g generally and you can never be specific you can't wave a, a thing and say this is for all these kind of people but a, a friend of mine who's a female executive uh search consultant uh is so frustrated by other women that she's getting going for key roles where she's trying to get as many women as she can. So there's more balance in the, the candidates coming forward and that they all have a chance. The, the blokes, we tend to blag it. If, we, if we've if we got five out of the 10 points that they're looking for, we go, yeah, I can sort of do that, learn the rest on the job. Whereas she found with her female candidates, they go, I've only got nine out of the 10. I, I really, I'm, I'm gonna withdraw. And and she they go, I'm not going to go through this. No, please stay in the process. No, no, no. And they would just self-select themselves out because they thought they hadn't quite got it all sorted. And uh, the so that was a, an interesting problem, which we need to work on. And the other interesting thing is many of the female leaders that I've coached, the most confident ones who have self-belief were from America and from Canada and from Australia. The British ones tended to uh, have a lot more self-doubt and imposter syndrome. And no, no, I'm, I'm not an inspiring leader, but this person is. And I go, no, no, you are. Everybody says you're an inspiring leader. And they would be very self-effacing. But that's general. You can't, you know, different people, different things. But the, the, there was, I found, a difference between nations. And then um, the... The, the tall poppy fitting, the tall poppy syndrome fitting in, uh, obviously I grew up in the British army and like friends of mine who were in the police, I had a friend of mine who's in my platoon and he went into the police and it was, when I was in the British army, there were no female officers. There were no, it, it was just a male occupation and the police has been very much the same. My uh, stepson is a police officer and there's still a lot, a long way to go. And as you've seen on some of these reports, but as you as you get promoted, the bubble goes with you and you sometimes don't get to see everything like the queen who always, or the king as it is now, always everything would smell of new paint and brand new toilets and things like that because people want to give you a, a good impression. So it's, it's, a, it's a hard one. Let's perhaps go on to moral questions. And we'll go around the Inspire Leadership Compass, this idea of, the integrated person who who is able to not be perfect in all of them, but but they're aware of the the interaction of all these components that make inspiring leaders. Moral caution. It's so important these days, and it's been something that you've I know, and we've coached and chatted together. It's so that you've held very dear to you doing the right thing, not just doing things right. You know what is the right thing to do? What have you found, Sarah? When you've let the compass slip and you have to bring it back to the values that you hold true and that you uh, are part of the organization you're part of. I think it links into the point I was making about trustworthy leadership earlier on. And I, for me, the issue of integrity is really important. And the, the problem um, that you could have as a senior leader is the danger of unintentionally misleading people, you know, particularly if you're making a, a public statement to, to reassure um, to reassure the public, um, you know, you're relying on briefings because you're not often talking about your direct experience. Um, and I used to feel very concerned about the importance of that. I didn't want just to have the lines to take. I needed to understand that what I was being told was 
was truthful, that it had integrity, that it was based uh, on, on on evidence. And you know that that's really tough. And I'm, I'm not saying for a for one minute that I kind of gave statements which weren't, but I really did, you know, try very hard to understand what the data was saying, the evidence, you know, just sometimes about challenging the rhetoric, sometimes a bit of scepticism and, uh, you know, and also just checking in with those who have lived experience who've been involved, you know, particularly, I guess, as a senior person, just checking with the guys and girls who've been actually dealing with the work, um, as well as kind of relying on, on what you're being told in some sort of you know fluffy warm PR uh, uh, statement, and and I think that's really really important. You know, it was important as a chief, but also leading chiefs nationally because you know the whole issue about post truth populism. You know, saying what people want to hear. You know, great challenges for the approach that I'm 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 talking about. And uh, I mean, I just just had one where I kind of spoke out last week, I was giving evidence at the Home Affairs Committee on their inquiry into trafficking. Um, and I, I decided um, that I would call out uh, comments that the Home Secretary had been making. She said last October that 80% of the Albanians coming across the channel in the small boats were claiming to be victims of modern slavery. Now, I was always very skeptical about that. Um, and in fact, the reality is when the data was published, it was only 12%. And it's this sense in which sometimes politicians get carried away with their own rhetoric because they want to make a populist point. Uh, and in this case, a, a point which, it, to my mind, uh, vilifies people from Albania in quite an unpleasant way. Uh, and I just think sometimes you have to say, no, actually the facts are, it's not 80%, it, it was 12% last year. And that's the highest it ever has been and ever will be probably. Um, so I do think um, you know, evidence data, I guess that's why I like research as well, about really understanding why is it that this is a reasonable position? Why is it this is a reasonable policy or, or strategy or, or, or public statement? Yeah. Uh, for me, that's really important. Uh, and, and it brings out the whole problem that we've got of social media and the way that it feeds people with their own reinforcing views. So if you're a Republican, you're getting data given to you by the the algorithms of the machines to give you more of the same stuff feeding your sort of sugar frenzy and if you're a democrat the same or if you're conservative or if you've got strong views you're we, we're getting very myopic in in our views and and actually as you're saying post-truth populism and polarization it is polarizing people into good or bad black or white rather than understanding that you've got to go for the facts and the data. To go from that really important part of being integrated, having integrity, having a consistency, a, tr a truthfulness, and, and relying on facts rather than just opinion, uh, to purpose and meaning, what, what some would talk about, spiritual quotient, but I call it meaning and purpose, PQ. Um, what sort of given your life a sense of meaning and purpose? And if you were to give advice to people, if they feel that they're rudderless and they haven't got meaning and purpose, what's helped you uh, have meaning and purpose in your life, Sarah? Well, I think I'd probably go back to my childhood. And I mentioned my parents earlier on. I was brought up in a vicarage. Uh, my father was a clergyman. My mother had been a nurse, but then stopped working to, to bring up the family, as so many women did in those days. And I think both of them had a supremely strong sense of, of service to others. Um, and that was based on their Christian faith. But actually, I saw that service uh, in action. So for me, um, a sense of what can you give um, as much or more than what can you take? Uh, and I guess linked to that, and, and maybe this is where the policing came in, senses of fairness and and a real concern about social injustice. I mean, I, I guess I was brought up in a, a quite a, to use your phrase, a bit of a bubble uh, in the vicarage. Um, and then I went into policing and, and I saw um, a very, very different side of life. Um, and that sense in which uh, for many people, they don't have a fair chance. They don't have the opportunities that I'd had. And so uh, linked to that, I guess, a sense of trying to empathize uh, with people um, 
I, I love, always love that phrase about walking in somebody else's shoes. I mean, at the end of the day, you've got to wear your own shoes. You've got to be your own person. But that ability to think about it from another person's perspective, I think, think is really, really important. So I, I would trace it back to home. Um, and these things, I think, are just like hardwired uh, in, in my DNA. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I think people really need to come back to their values and then what would give their how can they live a life of meaning and purpose rather than just one that pays the mortgage, which sadly too many, too many feel they're just going through the motions. Health quotient is the next, um, what we call physical and brain health. Um, many leaders who are in very demanding jobs like you have been um, can give their all to their job and indeed become workaholics and others around them suffer in their personal relationships. They don't spend enough time with them because they're constantly, uh, you know, I'll, I'll give you some time when I've served first 24 years of special forces duty, whatever it is, the, the, these first 24 years are to the service. And then I'll give my time to you and our relationship. But often by the time that comes, the relationship's over and the person's given up hope a long time before that. Um, and also looking after your own health, mental health and physical health, it does take its toll on people. And I'm sure you've seen that. I don't know whether without mentioning anybody specifically, whether you found the toll that is taken on police officers in some very tough situations. If they don't look after their health, it, it has ramifications later in life. What, what have you experienced and what advice would you give? Well, I think the point you make that when you've got a very demanding career, these things are, are really important, but they're the hardest to find time for. Um, and I frankly got better since I left policing. But even when I was policing, um, you know, the value of exercise, we, we have a, a place down in Dorset, which we get to as often as we can. So just lovely, you know, long walks, sea swimming, all of that kind of thing. Uh, really important. Even when I was uh, uh, most uh, challenged and working hardest, for me, also, the biggest issue, I guess, was sleep, you know, and I know the science has kind of caught up with um, my instinct, which was always uh, a good night's sleep was really important. Uh, and I've always been fortunate. I, I sleep really well. Um, what two things I would say about uh, policing, I think it still was certainly quite a heavy drinking culture and I've you know checked myself now in terms of the you know the habits that you get into which are, are now broken but I think that's really important just to kind of watch how much you're drinking because when you get older it's going to impact on your blood pressure um, and the other thing that I've done since I've um, not been working sort of full-time every day of the week uh, last year I got a lovely uh, red retriever puppy and uh, she is very demanding and she needs to be walked twice a day, whether we're in London or Dorset. And that is really good. Um, it's really good just to, you know, leave the even the mobile phone uh, is you know not looked at when I'm with the dog because she's still quite naughty. Um, and just the, you know, the, the, the requirement to go out in the fresh air, whether it's raining or whether the weather's nice. Uh, and just focus on on something else. I think I find that really, really restorative. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you totally. And uh, we've got Archie now and Willow, who's seven months old. And um, you, they, they've got to be walked twice a day. They, there's no excuses on that. They'll let you know if you think you can, uh, can get by it. But it, if you want to get fit and healthy, just having two walks a day out in the fresh air is a great one. Uh, emotional intelligence is the, the next component going around the Inspire Leadership Compass and to be integrated. Um, what tip would you give to people who are already quite smart listening to this, but they've, they've often been told that their EQ is pretty poor, they need to develop it. What, what If you were to give a tip, what would help develop their emotional intelligence? So I think, you know, leading on from other answers, a sense of listening and valuing different contributions is really important. Um, but this is something I have to work on, because um, if you uh, put me through a Myers-Briggs uh, assessment, I'm pretty strongly uh, J uh, in terms of judging. And I, I really do have to work on suspending my judgment. And that can also mean, you know, I need to control my facial expressions because I don't even need to say anything. It's just like a little kind of um, movement in the eyebrow uh, 
that just gives away what I'm really thinking about something. And I, you know, a few people, you know, people have said to me, oh, do you not agree, Sarah? I said, I haven't said a word, but I don't have to say a word because my face is, is um, too, giving too much, too much away. So, so I do still have to work on that. Um, while I think, you know, really important to listen, and, and I hopefully that's a thread that's run through, you know, I do know you can't listen and judge. Uh, and then maybe a, a compensator to that. Um, I think sometimes kindness is underestimated. Um, and one of the things that I did as a chief, despite the fact people used to complain they couldn't read my handwriting, in, in a world of WhatsApp and emails, I would spend time, you know, several times a week writing handwritten notes on my nice note paper uh, mm. and you know really try to make that a habit so whether that was people who'd done something good whether it's people who have been bereaved whether it's people who were sick whether you know um people mainly inside the organization but not always mm. uh, just the importance of that and actually in a day of electronic communications people love a handwritten note they do I, it's, it, i'm so with you on that the hard card note that sits on a windowsill that people always look back at it. Um, I have a little little handwritten note that's stuck on my window here, love you with all my heart, from my wife. And, and it's just been there for a couple of years and it's a lovely, it's a personal note from her and it always just reminds me. Um, CQ, Collaborative Cognitive Cultural Intelligence, uh, dealing with diversity, equality and inclusion. If someone's listening to this and they know it's an area they've got to improve, what would be your tip from your experience? Because this is an area you spent a lot of time on to improve it, that. Um, you know, we often talk about EDI, it trips off the tongue, doesn't it? Um, but in my experience, you know, particularly, uh, I guess, in, in policing, that I think sometimes the focus has been more on diversity than inclusion. And I think a bit of rebalancing between the two uh, is important um, because we're all so different in so many ways um, and we all bring our different gifts and talents uh, to an organisation, to a mission. Um, but I think what matters is that everybody with those differences feels valued and feels included. And, and what are we doing to make people feel included? Because sometimes it was too much about what we were, how we were all different, what we didn't have in common, rather than what we do have in common. And I, I, I think that's beginning to change. Um, and a sense in which, you know, even a small thing at, at the uh, investment management company I work with, um, our small team were trying to work out what we thought we might like to do something socially together. And, and it wasn't about saying X and Y are different, but actually we wanted to do something together which didn't involve drinking that didn't involve gluten you know i was trying to think what can we do which doesn't exclude people but actually includes everybody with their various needs and i think yeah. that's really important that would never have happened in policing in my day i guess they're a lot better now yeah um and i as a young officer in the army really couldn't believe how it i think it was it must have been 17 or 18 i was pressurized on a visit to a a, a yorkshire uh, infantry battalion and they were going come on lad you got to drink I go I don't drink oh don't be a wimp you know come on have you know have a pint and then another and then another and not surprising I was violently ill later that evening and I thought if if this is what the culture is about I'm not sure I want to join and now I th certainly think the younger generations are beginning to look at the pressure that some people in older generations put on them as their bosses come on you know come and have a pint don't be a wimp and um, it, it's unnecessary pressure and it's not right and people should be allowed to to um do things their own way and, and i generally don't drink very much uh and some occasions we'll go to an event not have a drink at all not not alcohol at all and i feel great because I, I can drive i can come back home but I, I was brought up in a culture where it was seen as a requirement and within that i saw many alcoholics who hid in that environment and made the rest of us keep them company and that's not good Resilience. You've had to uh, you've had to be particularly resilient in a whole range of things, whether it be um, any criticism you might face or just the relentless nature of the job. There's always work to be done in policing, uh, never enough police officers and always too many crimes to deal with because people will do evil and bad things. 
Um, what is your tip about people having resilience, but at the same time not overdoing it so it affects their health and well-being? Because you can work hard and be very resilient, but actually they they've someone said to me it's not about being fragile, resilient, it's about being anti-fragile, so that you don't break or work hard and then break, but you actually flex and learn from the situation and adapt to it. I don't know you come across the anti-fragility idea. Yeah, I mean, I think I'd go back to what I was saying about, you know, rest, sleep, exercise, time off, getting down to Dorset. You know, they would be my personal approaches, which enable me to have a degree of resilience. But I, I do think, uh, and it's to your point, that sometimes in policing, what's expected in terms of resilience is unreasonable. And if we think about police officers frequently exposed to trauma, and if they're working shifts, they're gonna be sleep deprived as well. Uh, and I think often the response is rather macho. Um, you know, if you can't cope with it, if you're finding it tough, then you're in the wrong job. And I think that can damage, of course it damages people. Uh, and I was just thinking about this myself because you, when you're in the organisation, you get carried away and, you know, people reward that kind of heroic, uh, you know, working 24 hours without a break. And it's just ridiculous. It cannot be good for people, uh, frankly, in, in the short or long term. And I, I was thinking about a, whether I could remember an example. And I just a, a small example. I remember when I was a chief, we were doing interview panels and I was chairing them and I, had a senior officer who was uh, interviewing with me and he came in to um, do the interviews in the morning and he'd been up all night dealing with a firearms incident and we all thought great that you know, sh you know you're great really tough great commitment I mean how ridiculous I should have just mm. sent him home to bed mm. Mm. to get yeah. into that mindset that's the culture of the organization yeah yeah and I remember everyone training other things you know get by on you know sleep is for wimps and you know you can sleep when you're dead and all, all this kind of ridiculous quotes and sayings um just quick fire for the last few because i want to get these in because they're they're really interesting topics what have you done by way of 360 bq brand reputation image uh, have you and do you think the police is going to have more of a 360 uh system uh, a couple of times a year where everybody at all levels is getting feedback from every angle so they can be better leaders what's what's your experience I mean, we did 360. I mean, I think sometimes it can be a bit mechanistic. We always used to laugh at in sort of February and March, the civil service clearly had to do 360 and you'd be inundated with requests to complete these uh, these platforms. Um, but I think seeking feedback from those you work with, uh, those you lead is really important, whether it's 360 or in other ways. And I, you know, I, I know um, in terms of my brand, you know, people would say that I had, you know, I'd, driven and energetic, you know, high expectations. And that can be quite tough. And I, I know through sort of assessment tools I've done, I'm pretty task oriented and I know I'm pretty competitive. Um, and so just being aware of that and thinking, okay, well, I'm not gonna stop being driven and energetic, but I can think about the impact on others. I can think about how I connect with people, um, you know, acting with a degree of, you know, Warmth and generosity. You can you can be quite steely, but actually, you know, it's the was it the Iron Fist and the Velvet Club. You know that that kind of thing. So I, I you know, I I did have feedback over the years, um, and uh, and I, you know, I would still say I'm not perfect, but I but I, you know, try to be aware of where my kind of tendency is. What am what are my kind of strong drivers uh, in in that regard? People yeah. often say to me, yeah. Uh, on leaving cards, we've learned so much from you. <laughs> I sometimes wonder what, whether that's yeah. a, altogether a good thing. Well, yeah, I always say that uh, working with Field Marshal Lynch, he was utterly scary. And uh, I was his third ADC. The previous two have been fired in less than a year each, which you're supposed to do a year. Um, I learned so much from him. Sometimes it was learning about how not to treat people as much as it was <laughs> about how to treat them. Um, quick one on legacy. Uh, very briefly, what would you like your legacy to be? And then, uh, yeah, what would you like your legacy to be? That would be good enough. Well, do you know something? It, it, I don't feel the need to kind of, you know, build some sort of uh, uh, statue in the desert. I, 
I see leading an organization, I've led several, you're a sort of, you're a steward. You know, I want to be a wise steward. You know, you're entrusted with the privilege of leading an organization for a brief period of time. And that organization is precious. And so um, it is something, maybe the legacy is about values, um, but it's certainly not about constantly changing everything. You know, I, I love the Hippocratic Oath, first do no harm. And I've always been really worried when people just throw everything up in the air, sort of change for change sake, particularly structural change, quite frankly. So I think it's probably about the values and the values um, that are exemplified in the people in the organisation and their relationships with the public. No, no, nicely put. I think it is uh, living our values. And, and people forget what you say, they forget what you do, but they never forget how you make them feel. And also they're learning how you're behaving, not the fine words that you trot out. Um, they're, they're measuring you on your actions. Um, I was going to come on to executive teams, then your favourite book and, and then top tip. So executive teams, when you've had to turn around a toxic team or had a toxic individual in it, what would be your advice to others when they've got the same kind of problem? If there was one thing, I mean, there's many things, but if there's one thing they could do. So um, it's really important to spend time thinking about how you work as a team. Um, when I was chief, we did the old red, green, blue, yellow assessment several times over the years because the team members were changing. And so I think that's important. But in terms of uh, top tip, it's you've just sometimes got to grasp those really difficult problems. And I remember early on when I, in fact, I was the interim chief uh, in 2006. So the year before I was made substantive chief constable, um, there was a need to select an interim deputy uh, and um, there were two internal candidates and the person who wasn't selected uh, began to behave really, really badly. Um, and um, it was having a destabilizing effect on the team. Um, and, you know, we had a conversation. I said, look, if you, if you have no faith in my leadership, then I, I think you're going to have to move on. This is really, this is difficult. And I, that was a very uncomfortable conversation. Um, but I think sometimes uh, you've just got to deal with the difficult people issues um, and have those very uncomfortable conversations. Did they change from a result of your, your challenge to them or did they have to move on? They found another opportunity. Yeah, which, yeah. I think it's often, I've seen this so many times when people set their heart on a particular job, internal promotion, and they don't get it. Um, and somebody else comes in, perhaps they were a candidate to get promoted into the top job, but someone else comes in and gets it. They can be real saboteurs. And ultimately, if they don't change, if you can't uh, change the people, then you have to change the people and they, they have to find their happiness elsewhere. Favourite book or a biography that you've enjoyed on leadership that, or might not be specific leadership, but you've drawn lessons from it. So I really struggled with this one. I, I can't remember the last book I read on leadership theory. I much, much prefer novels. But I think what I would say is um, what I do enjoy reading is um, biographies of political leaders or indeed political diaries. So whether it's Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, uh, William Hague on Wilberforce or any of the British prime ministers, Blair, Major, even Margaret Thatcher, or Alan Clark or Chris Mullins' diaries. I love kind of those sorts of uh, books. I find them fascinating. Um, it's really interesting to read about um, people's resilience, persistence, their calculation, their vision. Um, but I also think probably it's really important to, to understand history as well, to understand where we've come from, and it helps you, I think, uh, move forward. Fantastic. So um, this is now your uh, two minute top tip. If you'd kindly just because this stands in its own right, as well as being part of this podcast, would you introduce yourself, Sarah, please, uh, and say what your two minute top leadership tip? It could be, have a few components to it. What would your tip be? Hello, I'm Sarah Thornton. For a long time, I was a police officer, a chief constable for 12 years. I now work in the anti-slavery movement. And I've been asked for my top tip. Um, and it's something that I used over the years. Uh, it's um, not very profound, but I think it's very practical, which is eat the frog for breakfast. And it's basically get those nasty things over and done with. Um, it'd be very easy to put off eating the frog till the end of the day, but just get it over and done with and eat it for breakfast. And for me, it speaks to the fact that it's so tempting to procrastinate, to delay, to postpone tough decisions. 
Uh, and I found that if I do that, it only makes me worry. Uh, and as it says in Proverbs, worry weighs down the heart. Um, so whether it's tough people decisions, um, those times when you just need to say no, um, or when you just need to get around to responding to a complex dilemma or email, um, just do it. And then you can forget about it. Because a leader needs to be thinking clearly and not be weighed down by worrying about things that they should have done. Fantastic. Dame Sarah Thornton, thank you very much indeed for being on the Inspiring Leadership Podcast. And I look forward to our continued conversation. Thank you. My pleasure.